Well, we started 20 years ago in, uh, in Rotterdam, Crimson Architectural Historians, with six of us, all uh, historians. And uh, right from the beginning, we chose in a rather optimistic mood uh, to do, like, on the one hand, the, the traditional architectural historians' work. Maybe write books or curate uh, exhibitions or, or do uh, research on historical buildings. And on the other hand, we were uh, also involved in uh, design teams, working on urban planning concepts. One of the very first projects we did uh, was to work with Max One, a Dutch uh, young office then, 20 years ago, uh, to, th uh, to, to think of the basic urban concept for a new town uh, or a new extension of Utrecht in, uh, in Holland for a, a very large urban plan. And, and um, we were asked to think about how, how can you still kind of create urban uh, coherence in a time that uh, already social housing was being kind of privatized and a lot of the, the old really modernist tools of planning were, were kind of you know, losing their original power. So which new tools could you develop uh, to still uh, achieve uh, urban planning? I think we were always persistent in the idea that if you know history well that this is one of the key ingredients on which to build a future city and we also wanted to put this into practice and we had a chance to do that when we were asked to um, become involved in the uh, restructuring the revitalizing of um, one of the post-war neighborhoods close to Rotterdam which is called Hoogvliet. It was the most hated area in uh, Rotterdam really to quite unattractive and unpopular and uh, we were, of course, understandable for our, a number of reasons. It was quite unattractive, but um, well, building on these existing qualities, I think uh, it has improved immensely since. One of the things that's most striking about the exhibition is that you've set up an oscillation, a constant oscillation between two eras of history, prehistory and modernity. Um, could you tell me why you chose this dialectic in particular? It is basically uh, an exhibition on how British modernism is not just about modernization, about modern culture, but um, is inherently also including all those aspects of British culture that we all um, maybe associate with completely different architectural styles and not with modernism, but that are very much in there, like uh, the romantic notion of the ruin for instance, that has been present in British culture from the 17th century onwards, or uh, the notion of the pastoral or the landscape. Um, and we are showing how these notions are very much present in um, high modernist states like Milton Keynes, like uh, Thamesmead, and uh, like Hume and Cumbernauld. I would say that the exhibition is uh, not a didactic but an like, uh, evocative um, uh, exhibition showing how these themes are interrelated and how they all come back in different aspects in these uh, modernist estates, thereby also um, um, posing the question if these um, cities, these, these planned, uh, the, the sort of combination between planned and unplanned cities, uh, all have to do with cultural visions at, in the broadest sense of the world, word, uh, how do we um, um, pick up our possibilities of creating new cities for the future? And how do we make sure that this is not a technocratic thing, but again a cultural vision which relates to this broad conception of British culture also in the future? English mo modernity um, always had this strange double uh, or uh, very yeah, ambiguous relationship with history. On the one hand it was, info it was informed or obsessed nearly with history, with tumuli, with uh, Stonehenge, with the landscape. But it was also constantly retelling that history, reconstructing it. And uh, for example, Inigo Jones, when he redrew Stonehenge as a Roman temple, it was because he needed the history to be the kind of driving force behind his huge project for an English classicism. The same with John Wood who when he designed Bath Crescent, he said we have to make a combination of Stonehenge and Palladio and that will be our real English uh, style. And then when uh, Wilson and Womersley designed the Hume Crescents in Manchester, they said we have to build the Bath Crescents again 
but then ten times as big for the working classes. As soon as you go into the exhibition you see this amazing photo montage mural and the central, the central position is taken up by this grand sweep of the Royal Crescent in Bath which then melds into Hume Crescent and I was instantly reminded of Charles Jenks's critique of uh, specifically of Robin Hood Gardens and he claimed that it failed to achieve the grandeur and the homeliness that the Georgian architects had achieved in places like Bath. So is this exhibition a direct rebuttal of Charles Jenks's position? We at Crimson have a strange relationship to the concept of failure in architecture. We think that architecture or cities, uh, design cities, only get interesting once they start failing. If architecture would not fail and it would succeed, succeed in the sense of fulfilling to the letter the promises or the program or the prophecy that it has made, then why bother? Because then you would already know what would happen. What is to us really fascinating is the way that you build a new town and then the new town, before it is even finished, already gets perverted. Uh, either by stuff happening like uh, economic change, political change, or by the inhabitants not behaving exactly the way that the planners had wanted it to be, or culturally, like for example uh, filmmakers or pop singers or painters or, or novel writers ap appropriating uh, this, this construction, this design, and giving it a totally different meaning and then distributing that meaning into the culture, thereby completely um, uh, bypassing the original uh, concepts of the architect. So I think failure, uh, you know, the way that Jenks describes the failure of Robin Hood Gardens is the way that a tutor in an architecture school might, uh, might say that's a fail, because you have not, uh, you have not, uh, you have not checked the right boxes. But we think that maybe failure more in the Beckett uh, uh, sense of fail better, fail, try again, fail better. Um, we, we believe that failure is just another world, word uh, for a reality uh, taking over and then giving another layer of meaning uh, to a project. Charles Jenks, of course, used uh, the, uh, the means of, uh, of modernist architecture to further his cause for postmodern architecture. But uh, th that there is definitely two sides uh, to this story, um, that is something that we, would, uh, that we wanted to show in this uh, exhibition. Obviously, there are huge problems with Robin Hood Gardens. It, there were even worse problems with the Hume estate, with the Hume estates. But that does not take anything away from their ambition and their meaning also in, in architectural culture or in the culture at large. It struck me that uh, the works in the show stop very, at a very particular point in the 60s, before postmodernism. But it struck me too that when you were speaking earlier, some of your statements seem tinged with a certain postmodern sensibility. Do you think that's, that's fair to say? I think postmodernism as a conscious uh, kind of uh, or a deliberate uh, choice of, of ideology or de a deliberate choice of uh, attitude, I think that only is possible for a generation that also remembers the times when modernism was still really the dominant, uh, uh, the dominant dogma. I'm too young to be a real postmodernist. Because a real postmodernist is someone who, who made that conversion. You know, Sir Charles Jenks is a real postmodernist because he actually, most of his life, he, or mo before he became postmodernist, he spent as being a modernist uh, or a rationalist or w w what have you. So I think that postmodernism, as a, as a real conscious, uh, as a like a card-carrying postmodernist, you can only be that if you're around 70, I think. Cedric Price and his idea of non-plan crop up a couple of times in the show. Is he the villain of the piece? No, he, he's actually more the hero, I would say. Um, just as much as the, well, you, maybe you would expect that the uh, original planners would be the hero, but uh, in fact, this is also one of the agendas, if you see the last part of the uh, exhibition. Um, I think that we're not exactly 
uh, claiming that there should be like this new mass planning or there should be a revival of uh, top-down planning, not at all. Um, I think this um, sort of leveling of uh, planning that it is not only by professionals but also by local entrepreneurs, that it is also by inhabitants or by lobby groups or by uh, the steel pulse uh, scene or by uh, punks or by... This, uh, this is actually uh, one of the things that I uh, have the most hopes for, for the future city planning. Um, and also one of the things that I try to do with the Newtown Institute, how to find a way in which planning can also um, be open to other parties than professionals. But it also seems, just from looking at the pieces in the show, that, that people can repurpose architecture themselves. In Western Europe, because of the way that we organize and plan and control things, uh, inhabitants often have very little chance of uh, controlling their environment and having an influence on it. And you see that uh, in other countries where these uh, new cities have been less controlled and have been more open or have been sold to inhabitants or, you know, have developed, they have developed much more dynamically. Uh, they are much more uh, seen as a success and are not unpopular at all. There's, um, for instance, in our research we looked at one of the cities in Ghana, of all places, the former uh, Gold Coast, of course, where English planners, but also other Western European planners, had a, a big, uh, uh, made a big effort and, and produced uh, large cities. These cities look almost like uh, well, Stevenage or uh, Harlow, but uh, they're not unpopular. They're being considered the highest uh, range in housing and in amenities and in services and in schools and churches that you can find anywhere. So there is, uh, it's very culturally um, determined how these cities actually develop. As well as prehistory, utopia is another strong theme of the show. But since we're in Venice, it seems pertinent to ask, was Manfredo Tafuri right when he took a very pessimistic view of uh, utopian architecture? Is it possible for architects to build a better world? Um, I think there's uh, numerous examples and proofs that it cannot be done. And still, there is no other way than to try as an architect or as a planner. Because if you wouldn't um, want to achieve that, why even put any effort in it? So, uh, and this is this this kind of uh, uh, tragic interpretation of the the position of the architect or planner is. Um, I'm not sure if you uh, if this is one of the interpretations when you walk around in the exhibition, but this is one of the things that uh, fascinates me enormously. That you always, when faced with the uh, the question how to build a new city, how to build utopia, that you always have to find an answer to this uh, question, uh, knowing that it will probably be imperfect and. Uh, even more so, might end up in a disaster, because we have seen the proof of that as well. This period of modernism as an architectural period fits into a much longer uh, tradition, a much longer history. We, we take William Blake as the kind of symbolic starting point of that. The idea that when he wrote, uh, I will not cease from mental flight until we have built Jerusalem on England's green and pleasant land, that is the moment that he looks at the world around him and he does not like what he sees. He sees social unrest. He was actually uh, involved actively in the Gordon riots of 1780. He was there in the forefront of the, of the, uh, of the rioters, being swept up by them. He was shocked by the amount of poverty, inequality, the fat fatalism also of British society. And he said, we, we, we have to change things. And the idea of looking at the world around you and saying, we can and we have to change things, the whole realization that you are actually empowered to do that, that you can, can actually, that things are not, shouldn't, do not have to stay the way they are because it's given to us in that way, uh, that is modernity. You know, the fact that you can say, okay, I can look at the, the world as a construct and I can, reconstruct it. That is modernity. And the idea to build a new Jerusalem in our own land instead of just waiting for you to die and then be, uh, you know, and then go to a kind of a heavenly Jerusalem after, in the afterlife to say, no, no, we are, we are, it is our duty to build it here in the here and now. That is the starting point. State power was invested so heavily in architecture and architecture was given such an enormous mandate 
to build the real physical forms of the welfare state, that is something that never happened before and will never happen after. And I am sure that it, it, we will look back at it as a, as a very unique, historical, historically discrete uh, period. But what we try to do with this show is that this historically discrete period f uh, came out of a much longer period and one that I think does not have a natural end, and that is an idea of modernity. Something that, you know, the idea that communities, whether they are religious communities or ethnic communities, or maybe the state or shopkeepers or, or, um, or activists or political parties or cults, that they could all kind of think, uh, we have a vision for a new England, we have a vision for a new Jerusalem, we have a vision for a new community, we have a vision uh, for a new city. I think that is the kind of, uh, this, uh, the, the, cent the centrality of the imagination in shaping your environment, in transforming your environment, I think that is the real kind of red thread that we should continue. And we are not at all nostalgic about modernism at all. I mean that is also why we um, uh, present the model of Hume as a kind of a contorted fragment as if it were uh, you know broken off from the Acropolis and then presented far away from its source in a foreign museum. We, we look at it with enormous respect and fascination and, 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 uh, uh, and yeah, wonderment but we are, n we are not saying uh, things were much better when the state was building uh, social housing. You know, we are not. It's, it's a common complaint, at least from historians, that architecture students don't get taught any history. How do you incorporate history into the, into the architecture curriculum? I do not teach my students architectural history as architectural history. I, try, I use elements from history and from the present and from economy and from in a completely opportunistic and a completely uh, uh, f uh, hybrid uh, way. Um, uh, the lectures that I give, the, uh, the graduation studio that we teach, it's um, history plays, you know, we don't even talk about it. Okay, now we're going to introduce some history. Because, for example, when I, I taught a whole s uh, lecture series uh, what, for example about money and then of course you also talk about how money was used uh, uh, the financial instruments were developed uh, by, by new banking systems in Amsterdam in the 16th century etc et or 17th century so it comes very e it's it's uh, but I, I I never really think about architectural history as something separate as something else as, as something that you need to teach uh, in its in its own capacity you see that architects have always been using history, reconstructing history, retelling history as if it were an architectural project in itself. And in that sense, I think we are very different from classical architectural historians in that we are not so much in an academic way searching for the historical truth, but that we are interested in architectural history also as a malleable uh, kind of constructive, uh, projective uh, uh, thing. And to Return to the present day and the situation in England. What do you think about the current government's plans to revive the idea of the Garden City by building essentially new towns again, but under a new name? I'm not an expert in the, the, uh, uh, the UK planning scene, but it seems to me that uh, the, the whole Garden City uh, movement, which was also highly political at the time, eh, and which uh, was not only um, a spatial model or uh, a way to blend in city and countryside, but was also a very new social model that it has been uh, uh, sort of uh, watered down to something which is uh, quite innocent, the garden city that everybody likes and that, every, uh, that nobody could be against. Uh, while um, I'm much more interested in um, uh, cities that put a more um, rich and uh, challenging combination of uh, both ugly and beautiful, of both uh, garden and city, of uh, both high-rise high and low-rise, and that uh, offer a more um, uh, well urban uh, context. So I, I don't I don't see what the um, 
uh, advantage could see, apart from political, uh, from um, watering down this idea of the garden city so so much to this conservative idea of filtering out every modernist idea. So what's the future for, for you and for Crimson? I do not think that architecture is a, is a craft. The craft part might be an interesting uh, asset, but I think that architecture uh, could, an architect could do anything, absolutely anything. And he should not limit his, it, there, uh, he should not limit him or his or her uh, energies or ambitions uh, just uh, to building uh, spatial structures. I think the also if you look at the real history, what we think is the more interesting history of architecture, which is the one that we present in the show, uh, it is a history of ideas and a history of obsessions and a history of of. Um, of uh, interventions in, in political systems. It is a history of, of, of reimagining history. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, interfering type of, of uh, attitude that defines uh, the architect. And I think if, if people would think of being an architect more as an attitude or as an ethic than as a craft and as a job, they could do absolutely everything.